Bien, donc, bonjour à tous. Donc, euh, nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui euh, pour la soutenance de Théo Eiffel donc, sur Cryptography for Privacy Preserving Machine Learning. Et donc, euh, donc devant le jury composé donc, de Aurélien Bélé, qui est donc, euh, chargé de recherche à NVIDIA, euh, Yuval Ishal, qui est professeur à, au Technion, euh, Maria Georgieva, qui est ingénieure euh, cryptographe chez euh, IFER. Laurent euh, Massoulier, donc, qui est professeur à l'ENS, Jonathan passera Palbac, hein, qui est euh, donc euh, enseignant-chercheur à l'Impérial Collège de Londres, euh, David Poincheval, euh, donc, qui est professeur à l'ENS, et euh, Francis Bach, professeur à l'ENS, et moi-même, directeur de recherche au CEA. Donc Théo, tu as euh, 40-45 minutes pour nous présenter tes travaux. Merci. <rire> So, um, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome as well to those who are joining uh, online. Um, it's a great uh, honor for me to have you all today to um, my defense of my uh, thesis, which was done uh, at ENS in Ria under the supervision of uh, David and uh, David and, uh, Poncheval and Francis Bach. And uh, so, cryptography for Paris preserving machine learning. Um, Actually, everything started from my background as a data scientist and the issues I had working with sensitive data, like, like healthcare data. So what I propose for today is that we start from machine learning and then we'll explore the different uh, work that we have done throughout this thesis uh, to try to implement some privacy preserving uh, techniques for machine learning. So um, first, like take a, take a day like every day. Um, maybe like on the morning, you will um, listen to your favorite playlist uh, on your mobile application. And well, this playlist is actually generated using an algorithm which is uh, powered by machine learning. Say um, the pandemic is over, so it's the first time you go to your office, you're using a GPS. And um, actually, the algorithm that gives the itinerary is using machine learning. You arrive at the office, you uh, open your laptop, and your emails are filtered, and you don't have the spam, hopefully, uh, because you have an algorithm that is also using machine learning. So I guess you see what I want to say here is basically, in your everyday life, you are already using uh, machine learning. So what is exactly machine learning? Maybe that's the first question you can try to, uh, to answer. And um, So according to the Cambridge Dictionary, it's the process of computer changing the way they carry out tasks by learning from new data and result in a human uh, needing to give instruction in the form of a program. So there is two very important elements here. The first one is uh, learning from data. And the other one is that it, the task should not be expressed as simple instruction. So let's take maybe an example here. Um, If you try to classify a skin tumor as benign or cancerous, actually you cannot use simple rules to know if uh, it's cancerous or not. Like you cannot use the value of a specific pixel to know, okay, in that case uh, it's dangerous or not. So that's the spirit of what we mean by, uh, by this definition. Um, so I've said that machine learning is uh, developed in many areas, but is it really the case in healthcare? Um, I think we all know that uh, healthcare is generally under-digitalized, but actually it's also the fact in terms of development of AI uh, and machine learning. And I'm not really kind of these figures, but they're quite illustrative. Like if you take the market size of machine learning in um, marketing and the market size of machine learning in healthcare, uh, actually the one for ma marketing is three times bigger than the one for healthcare. And this obviously tells something. There is a problem in the development of machine learning in, in healthcare. So um, let's try to investigate this. To do machine learning, you need, to, you need two things. First, you need powerful processes. And um, for more than 50 years, the numbers of transistors in the chips has been doubling every two years. And which means that now we are able to have powerful processes to run Um, like um, neural networks like we do in deep learning, for example, that are quite um, uh, com 
computationally intensive. And the other thing you need is data. So with the rise of domestic data in 2010 and the fact that we all, we all use um, internet on our mobile phone, mobile phones, we have more and more data available. And so we have seen the development of databases like ImageNet or textual databases based on uh, Wikipedia. And uh, this did not happen actually for healthcare. And for very obvious reason, that is, uh, we are all concerned of, about our privacy and we don't want our medical records to be, uh, to be published. So um, I would like to address this notion of privacy, which is so important to understand why uh, machine learning has a problem in fields like healthcare with the notion of contextual integrity. Contextual integrity says basically that privacy is respected when an information flow from one individual to another one via, via a dedicated channel is appropriate with respect to the sender, the recipient, the person concerned, the type of information, and, uh, and the transmission principle. And um, there's a few remarks that we can do about this, uh, about this uh, definition. First, we are not talking about our own information, but uh, this would be secret. Just keep your own information private. You're also just speaking about private information you might have about other people. The second one is it's a positive definition. It's all about collaboration. It gives you a framework to collaborate while respecting privacy. So this is very interesting. And the last part uh, is the ethical dimension you have in this definition, because um, everything is related to the notion of appropriate which obviously depends on the context. And um, it depends on the context, but still it's very easy to uh, understand. And I will give you a small example to uh, get the idea of what we mean by appropriate or not. So let's take the situation where we have a patient uh, sending their own medical records to the doctor via secure messaging app. In this situation, uh, actually everything looks appropriate. Now, let's replace maybe the doctor by the employer or the secure messaging app with a public communication channel or the own medical report by the one of a relative. And then it becomes like much, uh, much less appropriate. So that's what I kind of like in this, in, in, in this definition. And so what I propose for, uh, for today is that we explore how privacy preserving, uh, preserving machine learning techniques uh, can be analyzed through the prism of contextual integrity. And, uh, and in the, so in the context of machine learning workflow. So here we will use the most simplistic machine learning workflow. You have an algorithm that you train on some data and then that you want to make public. In particular, we'll try to achieve three goals. The first one is that the data we use should not be directly exposed. Second one is that Machine learning models should not expose indirectly uh, the training data that they used. And the last one, which is the more conservative, is that the machine learning models themselves should not be directly exposed or disseminated. And to do so, we explore three different techniques. The first one is federated learning and attacks that you can have on machine learning models. The second one is diffusion privacy. And the last one is encrypted computation. So let's start with fairy tale learning. Um, as we have seen, when we are training uh, some machine learning models, the more data we have, the better our algorithm will be. And um, I realized that I'm not sure you had copies of the manuscript, which I think they are, are just there if you, if you need them or we can maybe bring them uh, at the forefront. So, um, we need a lot of data. So usually we'll take data that was created on different locations. And the usual way to do so is uh, to upload and centralize all the data, which is obviously uh, a big issue because um, the data owners will lose all the sovereignty um, on their data and they will have no control on how the data is later used. Um, another consequence is that we need to store huge quantity of data at a single place, which can be extremely challenging, especially like with imaging data. So, fairy learning goes the other way around. The idea is that we take our model, we make copies of the model that we send to different, to all the, to all the data uh, uh, location. 
The model is then uh, trained locally and an updated version is sent back and aggregated with the others. And this way we iterate until we, um, we achieve sufficient accuracy. Uh, the benefits of this are, are quite uh, obvious compared to the other one. Now the data owners have full sovereignty over the data. Um, there is full transparency on the computation because the computation is done uh, locally. And as part of this thesis, we have worked on developing a fairy learning library called PySift. And, and this was one of our light motif in the thesis was to provide concrete implementation of some um, concepts to make sure that machine learning uh, practitioners could use them without uh, any expert knowledge. So let's get back to our first uh, notion of contextual integrity. We have now achieved the first goal, which is that the data is not directly exposed because it never leaves the location. Now we have two more goals that we need to uh, take care of. <coughs> the first one is that machine learning should not disclose um, information about the, pri uh, the private data. And this is an issue because there are known attacks against uh, machine learning models that actually disclose uh, information about training data. And uh, we will see uh, some, some families of attack just now. So the first one is um, model inversion. So here the idea is to try to reconstruct completely uh, training samples. Uh, there is a very popular attacks from uh, 2015 that use a train model as a black box and attack it in order to reconstruct so, uh, training samples. We have an, an example here, or maybe more closely related to our, uh, to our topic, um, an attack during a federal learning process where the central server is actually performing the attack and is uh, leveraging the model updates of the different data owners to try to reconstruct their different, um, different data. So here's a, a, sorry, an example. So obviously, like this is, these are examples that work particularly well. It's not the case for all the samples in the training data set, but it's still, um, it's still a, an important issue if we can uh, even reconstruct one individual in our data set. So this was for model data inversion. Another very popular attack is a membership inference. And in that case, what we're trying to do is not to reconstruct the training sample, but to know if whether a sample was part or not of the training data set. In this scenario, um, we can think of an example like we have a clinical trial and uh, we are trying to um, uh, use patients with a, with a particular disease to train a machine learning models. If you're able to, uh, to do such attack, then you're able to know if a patient was part of the trial or not. And, and so this patient might have a particular uh, disease. So this is obviously um, an important issue. As part of this thesis, we have developed a new family of attack that we have coined collateral learning. So collateral learning actually um, goes this way. We take a very typical setting. We have a neural network that we, um, uh, that we are using to classify some, uh, some image with some digits that are handwritten. Um, so the output values are between zero and, and, and nine. And so we have um, 10 output neurons. And uh, the, the output neuron that has the highest signal, so here's the nine on the figure, uh, correspond to the class that is represented on the figure. So that's basically how it works. So what we did is we designed a data set um, with two classification tasks. The first one consisted of detecting uh, the digit that was on the font, on the, on, on the image. And the other one consisted of detecting the font that was uh, used to write the digit. So these two tasks are really mixed together. And what we wanted to do is uh, to be able to do the first one without being able to do the other one. And uh, so the setting goes as such. Uh, for some reason that I will make clear later, uh, we had a fixed um, depth for the, our neural network. And we were trying to so perform the first task to have a better accuracy. We used a few extra neural layers um, that we put on top of the output. Then the fixed network was freezed and provided as a, a black box to an attacker. And now the attacker was supposed to add a few layers. 
not to do the main task, which was digit recognition, but now to do the phone prediction, so the collateral task. And so we train an adversary and we try to observe the, uh, the result. What we show is that on the first task, we have very high accuracy, which is understandable. It's like it's a very classic standard and easy task. So uh, this was expected. Which what was not expected was the high accuracy on the second task, where we get an accuracy that is as high as 93%. Um, so this is a toy data set. We don't, it's not really important if, if the attack is, uh, is this effective. But on a real world data set, let's say like you, wanna, you have some image and you want to classify the sport that is done by the, by the different people. If you train a model to um, classify the sport, and this model can be used to do something completely different, like detect the gender or the ethnical origin, obviously we have, we have a, an important issue here. So we uh, tried to look for mitigations. Uh, the first one that we proposed was that because um, we had a few layers on top of the original input, we were actually able to reduce the size of the output. So from Penarum, um, we reduced the number. And what we see is like with uh, three or four levels, the main task error is still very low, while the curatorial error uh, increased up to uh, 25%. So here is the task for only uh, uh, classification between two fonts. So the baseline should be 50%. So the attack is still successful three times out of four, which is not very satis satisfactory. So we tried a second mitigation that we combined with the first one, um, which was uh, based on adversarial learning. The idea is what was to simulate an adversary and to jointly train our main task against uh, the collateral task for a simulated adversary. What we show here is if we take an output size also here like maybe of uh, four neurons, the uh, main task is still very efficient up to um, 99%, while the collateral task is now as low as 50, uh, 55%. This is good, but it's kind of expected. We have simulated an adversary. We have a good resistance against it. It's, uh, it's quite um, predictable. What we investigated is if we had also resistance uh, the, uh, against other kind of adversary, so other neural network or models that were completely different. And um, what we observed was that for models like for sufficiently high, a big neural network use in the simulation, we were able to get resistance against a large family of, uh, of classifiers or reversals, and the accuracy never gets uh, bigger than um, than uh, 50, uh, 59%. Well, that's, that's still used for the cryptographic community, but for machine learning and, and from where we started, it's already it's already better. Um, so this was for for collateral learning. Actually, for other attacks like membership inference or model inversion, um, the solution that we usually use is uh, differential privacy. And this is what we will explore now. Maybe I will start with uh, giving you a small intuition on how it works. So the objective here is to ensure that uh, statistical analysis should not compromise the privacy of any individual. Uh, we are aiming at perfect confidentiality, meaning that the result of the query should be indistinguishable if we add or remove a single element in the data set. So let's take an example. We want to compute our statistical analysis is uh, that we want to compute the mean of, of the salaries in this database. So if we do it um, with and without bot, we get results that are very distinguishable. So we are far from our objective, and we are so much far from this objective that we are, with these two values, we are able to reconstruct with simple arithmetic uh, the salary of both. So this does not respect at all different privacy. Now, say that we had a bit of noise. In this scenario, this computation uh, will not work anymore. And if we had sufficient noise, actually, even it becomes in this thing, uh, impossible to know if uh, Bob's was uh, was part of the data set or not. So this is the basic intuition behind differential privacy is to add the proper nodes that is uh, correctly calibrated to obtain uh, the um, desired level of privacy. 
That's the formal definition. It actually says the same uh, same thing. If you take two uh, data sets only different in one item, and you analyze the behavior of an algorithm train of these data sets in terms of distribution, the distribution should be controlled uh, by, which should be similar up to a margin that is determined with this epsilon and delta. And this is what we call the privacy budget in the privacy. The idea is if the margin is small, then uh, the behavior are very similar, so we have high privacy. And, uh, and the other way around. So this was for classic uh, standard uh, statistics like the mean, but actually it worked the same way for, um, uh, for machine learning. Um, there's a very popular method that is uh, named uh, Different Private Stochastic Gradient Descent. And it relies on the same principle in the sense that what we do is we add Gaussian noise in that case directly on the model updates of the different uh, data owner when we send back the update uh, to the central server. And the particularity that we have here is that um, uh, we need to iterate as we're doing machine learning. And the more you access data, the more uh, it will influence the model. And this is uh, transcribed by an increase of the privacy budget each time you iterate. Uh, so one solution is to say, OK, I have a limited access to, uh, I will iterate only n times to, um, on my data sets but I may not reach uh, conventions. Or what I might be tempted to do is, OK, I would like more noise to have better uh, guarantees. Uh, of course, the more noise you add, the worse your, your model will be in terms of utility, because at some point, you end up just adding some, some noise. Well, that's the trade-off we have um, in, in the privacy, and this was our starting point. We added uh, oh, another working hypothesis. Because in, in, uh, in uh, DPHDD, we assume that the model iterates are made public at, uh, at each iteration. Now, if we can hide the model until the training has completed, assumingly, we should leak less information. So we started from a paper uh, of, from last year that uh, leveraged um, privacy analysis using Langevin diffusion. And they show that for full gradient descent, for a particular set of smooth and strongly convex objectives, we are actually able to have um, to, to have conversions of the privacy uh, of the privacy budget, while it's roughly uh, growing in square root of, of, of k for uh, DPSGD. So this result is really really interesting. It has some limitation like the, like the smoothness and, and, and convexity, but the fact that it could converge was uh, quite interesting. So our contribution was to propose a stochastic version of this result, uh, which would be more practical for machine learning users, because um, uh, in particular, compute, computing the gradient for the complete data set might be uh, prohibitive in some situation when we have big data sets. Let's get back again to our notion of contextual integrity. Now we can achieve the, the second goal, which is that using the privacy, it has been shown that the model is um, more resistant to attacks like model inversion or uh, membership inference. We are now, now trying to ask the last question, how can, we, how can we make sure that this model will not be um, copied, disseminated, or exposed? Why should we do this? Actually, there is a there is a really um, interesting example that I've heard of a couple of days ago. This works. I guess you all know uh, the security scan in the airports. Um, actually, the company that manufactures the machine is not the same as the one that manufactured the machine learning model to do the detection of, uh, uh, of dangerous objects. And the manufacturer is actually very interesting in stealing the machine learning models that they don't have to pay the, li the license anymore. So uh, what the company that is uh, delivering the machine learning has to do is to find ways to still ship uh, the model on, on the device, but hide from uh, any actors that are actually on the device, like the manufacturer. So this is where we um, start speaking about encrypted computation.
So actually, when I say encrypted, I don't really mean encrypted. I mean that the model should be usable, but not visible. I say this because the last one is does not, the last technique does not really rely on encryption. But I would like to give you an insight on these three different techniques. The first one is, um, is homomorphic encryption. And the general idea is quite uh, intuitive. So you have Alice and Bob, the one maybe to ev evaluate a trained model on some image. And homomorphic encryption provides a way to encrypt data in such a way that you can still operate on top of it. So in this situation, what we will do, we we'll encrypt the model and the data and perform private evaluation. Because everything is encrypted, the output is also encrypted. So then the, the output has to be sent back for decryption. There is a variant that we have uh, investigated, which is functional encryption. It's basically the same thing, except that the private computation and the decryption are bundled together. So I will give you an example still with, with Alice and Bob. Bob has this email server um, that he used to do spam filtering, but he does not trust the server to uh, read his private communication. So uh, what Bob will do is to provide a functional key to, uh, to encrypt the spam detection algorithm and will distribute some private keys to its correspondence, like Alice. So Alice encrypts her email and sends it to the private server. Then, exactly how, uh, like we had on homomorphic encryption, what we do is we do the private evaluation and we get directly, because it's bundled together, the decryption. In this case, so the only thing that the server learns is nothing about the content of the email, just if it was a spam or not a spam. And then he's able to maybe send a notification to, uh, to Bob. Uh, as part of this sense, we have worked on a, on a quadratic um, algorithm because in practice, we are not able today to uh, do in an efficient way uh, algorithm as complex as the spam filtering in functional encryption. So we work on a quadratic version of an algorithm uh, that we show was equivalent to a, ne a network with one hidden layer and a square uh, um, and a square activation function. This is uh, this is actually the network that was used for the collateral uh, learning attack. That's why it has to be fixed. Um, okay, let's let's switch to the last part. So community part computation. So the definition is the set of methods for parties to jointly compute a function over the input while keeping this input private. There are several techniques, but we will focus on additive secret sharing. And um, basically, I will give you a small, a small example of how it works. Say we have Alice and Bob, and now this private inputs, and they want to compute on top of this input, maybe and the simple addition. So the result, as you might expect, might be 10. Now what they do is they do this secret sharing part. So um, it means that the bit shares that so usually there will be random shares in huge space, but for the sake of this example, I've put simple numbers, and um, they will exchange the shares. Okay. And now they are able to start computation on these shares. So maybe we are trying to do addition, and all they need to do is actually perform local addition on the shares, which they do, and they create new shares. And the beauty of this uh, kind of algorithm is that these shares are actually the shares of the, ex of the expected result. So, um, yeah. Uh, so secret sharing, a few, few remarks about this is the first, because each party receives random shares, they cannot reconstruct um, the data alone. It just looks like random information. And most importantly, it provides shared governance. What it means is that data can only be used or decrypted collectively if everyone or a sufficient subset of parties agree to do so. And that's a feature that is quite interesting compared to other protocols. Maybe let's get back to machine learning. So if you take neural networks, they're just composed of neurons that are like parameters and in the case of like image, it's just composed of pixel. All of this information can be actually secret shared exactly the same way. 
But we need more operation than just addition. So we need multiplication, which is not very difficult. Basically, what we'll do is we usually use what we call a crypto provider that will provide some cryptographic primitives to different uh, parties. And there will be one extra interaction between both, and they will get shares of the, of the multiplication. The last part, which is maybe the most tricky, is uh, private comparison. The reason we need private comparison is that um, we are using uh, a very popular activation function that is called Relu, and that is basically a private comparison. When we started, uh, there were already some um, algorithm exist existing for IoT secret sharing, but they were a bit um, complicated in terms of round, number of rounds of interaction that you had to do between the parties uh, to complete the comparison. So we use another technique that is called a function secret sharing. And I will give you like some intuition on how it, how it works. So say we want a computer function, so a comparison to a threshold. We start out additive secret sharing. We have our private inputs. We're already familiar with those. We apply a protocol, and um, then we derive so a public protocol, and if this works, and um, and then we get secret shares of the private uh, result that you can maybe some to get back to recover the result. Actually, functional secret sharing goes the other way around. We start from a public input. And you have what we call like private function shares. So in this case, um, a function share could be maybe a comparison to a threshold that is unknown. And it goes the same way on the end of the computation. You end up with shares of the secret shares of the private result, and that you can use to reconstruct those. This does not fit our framework because we are using uh, secret shared inputs. So the way we can um, use function secret sharing is by using what we call random masking. So random masking is actually very simple. What we say is our cryptographic um, um, third party, our crypto provider, is res responsible for sending the function shares. And we also ask him to send us private share of a completely random uh, number, which we call alpha. Say our private input is actually x. So as we have seen with a small uh, example of Alice and Bob, they are able to reconstruct uh, the addition of x plus alpha without disclosing alpha. So this would be our, um, our x. And so x would be equal to y plus alpha. And because alpha is completely random, having access to x publicly does not reveal anything about y. And then what we do, of course, because it's provider is responsible for delivering the mask and the function shares. Uh, the threshold in the function shares will actually be the same value alpha. So if we are re using real numbers, actually computing the, the comparison between x and alpha should be equivalent to computing the comparison between y and 0. So this is for the setting. Then if we go a bit more in details in the algorithm, uh, we actually um, use a bit per bit private comparison. So um, let's take an example of how the binary decomposition works. Say we are decomposing on three bits, and then this value 0, 1, 0 is actually equivalent to the value 2. And uh, so to do this decomposition, to start the protocol, uh, the first thing we can, we can uh, do is all parties have a public access to x, because now it's a public value, so they can do it on, the, on their own. And um, the bit decomposition of alpha will be done by the cryptographic uh, provider. The algorithm goes this way. Um, the idea here is that we will do so a bit per bit comparison, starting from the most significant bit down to the least significant one. But this actually spans a binary tree like, 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 like this one for the case of um, n equal to 3. Uh, we have taken uh, alpha here to be uh, 0, 1, 0, so equal to 2. <coughs> so we start from the most significant bit. Here, if x1 is bigger than alpha 1, so if you go on this side, actually, no matter what are the computation later on, we know that the computation will be false because we'll be on the, uh, on, on the right side of the tree. 
If now we compare the seven bits and X2 is lower than alpha 2, in this case, so we are here, no matter what happens next, the computation will be true. And if both bits are equal, we need to go to the next one uh, to, to decide. So this is exactly how the protocol is uh, implemented in practice. And we do this bit per bit comparison, and we get, uh, we get so n plus 1 states that we combine together at the end to, um, to get private shares of the result. And this is the intuition of what happens under the hood. So maybe, um, why did we use function structuring for private machine learning? The first interesting fact is that it only relies on very lightweight cryptographic, uh, cryptographic primitives. Basically, all we need is to compute AES, and AES is very simple to, uh, to compute. This allowed us to do a, uh, an implementation on the GPU. Um, and uh, most importantly, it only needs one round of communication uh, in the online, online phase to, um, uh, to, be, uh, to, to be computed. So uh, this is uh, very competitive uh, compared to other protocols, and this was the main reason what, why we invested in, in, this, um, in, in this protocol. There are some drawbacks. The first one is, well, the, the main one is that the cryptographic material that is sent ahead of time by the crypto provider is actually very heavy. If you take a real case and example, like you're trying to do private evaluation on a ResNet 18 on a 200 per 200 pixel image, these keys are as heavy as two gigabytes. So this is a limitation in practice if you want to uh, do either a lot of evaluation or some training, you cannot store all these keys. We, so we bundled this protocol in a privacy preserving uh, machine learning framework that we called Arian, and uh, we were able to do training on some small models like Linux, where we see that we achieved the same accuracy that we would have in plain text uh, in a couple of hours. Uh, we were able to do private evaluation on bigger networks like uh, VGC16 or ResNet18 uh, Res in a couple of seconds. Actually, with the GPU implementation, we were able to go uh, even further in terms of runtime. So this, is, this runtime becomes interesting for real case scenario. And we showcased one in uh, this uh, study that was aiming at uh, performing a private um, a a private detection of uh, a virus or bacteria in um, uh, child chests. And so Ion was used here as a secure inference of the service uh, setting. So this is a setting where the latency is really important. So you have one image, you are trying to get a diagnosis on this, and so you don't, ha you, you don't want to wait for, for hours of just, and so having a prediction in a couple of seconds here uh, was, um, was interesting. And most interestingly, um, the fact that we, you cannot use batching here to have better performance in your benchmarks. So uh, here you only you really depend on the number of communication rounds, and that's why function integration is, is quite interesting. And this network, so it was ResNet 18, um, was like a real world scenario because it achieved on this task expert level um, uh, accuracy. So. Back to our notion of uh, contextual integrity, we now have uh, a way to, uh, uh, to propose that the model can be either completely uh, private during the training or using a secure inference as a service scenario uh, when the model is already trained uh, on other resources. A few, a few remarks. Um, the first one is this algorithm is only having honest but curious security. What it means is that the parties um, should not deviate from the protocol. And if they don't deviate from the protocol, no information should leak. But if now your parties start to do some malicious uh, activities, they might, actually, uh, they might actually have some bad consequence on the security of the, of the whole protocol. The other important, uh, important fact is 
So the model is not private, is not visible during the training. And this was exactly the uh, assumption that we were relying on to um, use some methods based uh, on artificial privacy based on noise ground diffusion. So it shows that you, you can have powerful combination of several privacy preserving techniques, and um, and which like can be uh, can be really, I think investigated further. So to conclude, a few a few remarks. Um, privacy preserving techniques obviously have an important impact either on the runtime when using like functional sequestering or on the accuracy, like techniques like diffusion privacy. So the use of these techniques really depends on the context. And that's why the notion of contextual integrity is so important. It gives a framework to try to uh, know what method could be should be used or which one is actually not relevant because the security guarantees that we need to have are not this important. Second is this work uh, was a very cross-domain research. This is a challenge because it's very difficult to have a precise picture of all the different areas that we try to work on. But it was also an opportunity. Um, maybe like two examples would be so this positive interaction that we can expect from different privacy and encrypted computation, or the fact we are able to uh, provide the GPU implementation of a cryptographic protocol only using a machine learning library, actually. We, all this implementation on GPU was made using PyCorch. Um, another, oh, and, and another part is um, my personal like, belief is that we need more open source implementation uh, if we want to accelerate awareness, especially for people that are not, there are not that many experts in different privacy and, and cryptography, but there are needs for the broader machine learning community to be able to use these tools. Nowadays, there are more uh, libraries like Opacus, Scripton, TensorFlow Privacy, TensorFlow Federated, and, and the Open Mind community, but um, those libraries are not always very easy to use. They are not always paid on Python, which makes that you will lose a part of the community, and, and sometimes they are more done for research than for education. Maybe the most important remark here is that in practice, real life data needs intensive cleaning and structuration to be usable, especially in healthcare. And this cannot be done if you don't have a direct access to the data or if data is not encrypted, which means that it should be done ahead of time. So there is a great challenge here to make the data available for search privacy preserving analysis. And if it's not available or not clean enough, all of this technique will, be not, will not be usable in practice. Last, so this was a technical presentation. Obviously, this challenge is also a social, economic, social political, a legal. There is a lot of regulation around this and an and economic challenge. So thank you very much. In particular, I would like to uh, thank my directors, David and, uh, and Francis, the jury that has accepted to uh, assess my work today, the team at TNS, and the former student postdoc at TNS as well, um, the Open Mind community, the uh, Arcan team, obviously, and uh, my friends and family and Mayan for their long standing and um, uh, long standing support. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Theo, for this uh, presentation. So, we still have some questions to ask you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we start with the referee, uh, perhaps uh, according to the geographic distance. So I'm going to... Okay, hi. So thanks, uh, Theo, for the presentation. It was a pleasure to attend it and to see this. Um, so I have a couple of questions about... Uh, let me start with the encrypted computation part. Um, so what, what is the current uh, slowdown uh, factor if you look, let, let's look at your fastest uh, implementation versus evaluating the same uh, computation here without any uh, security requirement? Uh, do you have an estimate of the current slowdown factor and then how much better do you think it can get? So um, the slowdown is around 
101,000. So that's that's huge, and, <coughs> and it's so much important that it makes these techniques uh, not very viable for domains like natural language processing, because we already have troubles running this um, language processing models on standard GPU. So if you increase the runtime by a thousand, uh, you won't be able to, um, uh, to, to to use them. What was, what is interesting is that for maybe for um, image recognition, we have powerful models that are not that big, like ResNet or VGG16, and we are able still to have uh, uh, realistic uh, runtimes. Um, so yeah, this, I think this would be the, the runtime um, factor. And what was interesting was to investigate, so how much of this time is spent on computation and which, and how much is spent on communication. What we, uh, what we show is that um, most of the time was spent on computation. So uh, basically doing a lot and a lot of AES. And so um, that's where the GPU implementation is really uh, promising. So what we tried was a very naive one using PyTorch and result optimizing a lot the, the memory. So we could expect better implementations. Uh, but this would be my uh, the main uh, area to, to explore to get better results. And um, also, maybe one, one fact, because in the literature, we have this analysis that exists in other paper, but usually this is done, at, well, it was done as well, because we, we, we just follow the trend for a batch um, for batch computation. So it means that you will do um, an analysis of 100 pictures, and then you see, okay, how much time I spend on computation, how much time I spend on, on uh, communication. Um, this gives wrong uh, inputs in the secure inference of the service where you're just trying to send one image and where in that situation the communication part will become much more important. Um, especially if you have high latency, like if you have two parties that are uh, that are far away and you have like maybe 0.1 second of latency, then uh, actually uh, that's the part where these protocols would, portion sequestering would be much more efficient than the other one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Uh, so, so continuing uh, along the same line, so um, um, so there have been some works to try to uh, uh, to minimize the, the cost of security by uh, doing things like using lower precision. Uh, you know, so you mentioned 32 bits. Uh, you know there are works that push it as far as four bits or whatever. Maybe at the price of the accuracy. Uh, you can try to replace the remove by simpler function, maybe some of the remove by squaring, which you also mentioned in the, in the function of uh, encryption based approach. So, did you consider these types of optimizations as a way to make things then uh, run faster? So, yeah, that's that's a good question. So, on the activation part, um, so the, we had two considerations. The first one is we wanted to have. Um, like deep uh, networks, like ResNet is uh, so 18 uh, layers. And in that case, if you use like maybe square activation, your model starts to become completely unstable. So um, you will not be able to do anything with this kind of model. So square activation is is quite interesting for small networks. As they were explored first, I think for CryptoNest or work like this, where you have just a couple of layers and it performs well. Um, the other fact that we, uh, uh, the guarantee that we wanted to, to have is that we wanted to be able to use a model that is pre-trained somewhere and uh, to convert it in the encrypted world. So in this, in this situation, we needed to be able to replicate all the layers that existed in standard machine learning so we would not have to train a, a custom ResNet with some layers where that would be a bit uh, uh, non-standards. Um, on the um, uh, quantization part, so reducing the number of bits for the uh, digital encoding, um, we had, so I've not, I've, I've skipped the slide, but we have an issue with this protocol is that we have a small uh, uh, probability of failure, which is one in, uh, um, in 100 uh, millions, but uh, it's small because we use a sufficiently big uh, encoding space. If we reduce it, say even to 16 bits, then it will increase a lot and you won't be able to do anything proper with this protocol. But um, 
uh, I think you and your teams actually uh, just published um, another version of this protocol that actually doesn't have this error and have the same efficiency. And in this case, I, I think we should uh, we should be able to leverage at least 16 bits is still quite easy to do training. If you go under, you need to be very careful about what you're doing. Uh, otherwise, you lose conscience. OK, yeah, thanks. This makes sense. Uh, you, you mentioned that you're limited to semi-honest security, but uh, have you thought about doing this speed style approach of just doubling, redoubling the amount of uh, uh, correlated randomness? Uh, did you look into getting malicious security in this way? If not, we can. So no, we we did not actually uh, explore this way. Um, we we made the the assumption that we could have this uh, setting that maybe it's what is called cover security, mm -hmm. where you can just sometimes you um, you ask like random operation to the crypto provider, and you check if it's still acting uh, honestly, and because this. Uh, crypto provider in, in the real world might be an institution that is uh, caring about this reputation should behave by default properly, but it's not it's not a, a strong guarantee. Thanks, thanks. And, and the final question about the differential privacy part. Uh, you mentioned the privacy budget. Uh, how does this work in the real world? What if the same user uh, participates in, in multiple studies and so on? How, how do you plan for this? So that's that's a very complicated ch uh, challenge in practice. Uh, um, you have this uh, this notion is in fact that once you have consumed your privacy budget that you are able to um, to give for your records, you should not use them anymore. And um, and this is an important consequence because it's anymore on any study that you might do uh, later. Um, I don't know. I really don't know how we do this in practice. I, I've spoken with people in, in um, um, the Health Data Hub, which is a, a, a government, French government institution that are trying to investigate new privacy prison techniques. They don't know as well. Uh, we're trying to, to find a way. It's not clear how we can do this, uh, but um, what is sure uh, is if we don't, if we only allow tiny amounts of privacy budgets to be spent to keep them for later, uh, then our studies really become quite uh, quite uh, bad, especially like in machine learning, where we know that when we go, well, it's evolving quickly, but usually uh, you need your epsilon equal to one to uh, uh, to have a proper accuracy on your model. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Aurelia. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot for the presentation. It's been a nice overview of, uh, of your contributions, which are I think quite impressive in that. So of course at the intersection of ML and, and crypto, but also includes uh, algorithms, theory, some implementations, some applications. Uh, so I wanted to congratulate you for that again for that. Um, okay, I'll start with some questions, maybe a bit uh, on your specific to your contributions, and maybe maybe a couple of more, more general questions. So on the part on adversarial uh, learning, yeah. Uh, so I was, so some, I guess my own experience of trying to use adversarial learning for uh, privacy, so for, for trying to remove, suppress information, is that uh, it, it's not so easy to make it work I think in a robust uh, manner. Uh, so I wanted to hear a bit your experience uh, on this, whether you, to which extent you investigated. Uh, how this information may still be hidden, maybe somewhere in some kind of uh, lower kind of order magnitude or something like this of, of the data, which may be both the data could still be achieved. So, um, yeah. So what what is quite uh, um, what is interesting on these figures is that actually this uh, this mitigation does not work for on the output size equal to ten because you can see that the Accuracy on the attack is still very high, and um, so it was not sufficient. This way, this method alone was not sufficient, um, and so we had to combine it with the output size reduction to have it work. Uh, which means that um, uh, here the issue was really the amount of signal that you would put out of your uh, of your model um, that you needed you needed to control uh, to control. Um, 
and and this as you mentioned does not even uh, uh, give intuition on how the attack will perform if you start start exploring the intermediate layer and not only the output layer we did not investigate this because we supposed that the model was provided as a, as a black box as we have our, our, on some uh, homomorphic encryption paper um, but uh, so this would be the first part uh, i think about still uh, some ways to, 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 to attack the model in, uh, by using other signals and um, and it really relied on uh, on the output size. Um, I think you mentioned um, in your report that it could be interesting to use this on another data set and so did not have the opportunity to do so but it would be also interesting to see if the effectiveness of, of this method is due to the fact that this data set was very simplistic and if it will still work on more complex data sets like, uh, like the other one with the people doing sports. And, and one, of, one of the reasons is that we did not have such data set already labeled. Um, and that's why like, we, are, we have created this toy data set, which was very easy. You just have to print some fonts on top of the image. Um, but having this data set with two tasks uh, at the same time, uh, we did not find it when, when we were trying to, uh, to do this analysis. Okay, so I think there is nice data in speech, uh, for instance, where you have like speaker recognition, speech ah, recognition, but okay, this involves also kind of complicated architecture. Yeah. So, so those are kind of difficult experiments <laughs> to, to, to run, I guess. Um, okay, switching to the DP part, maybe the differential policy part. Uh, so in your in your analysis, you you leverage right some kind of uh, uh, privacy guarantees from from subsampling, the fact mm -hmm. that you subsample a batch. Uh, which kind of improves the privacy guarantees of, of, uh, of the stochastic gradient descent. Usually, to so obtaining such uh, amplification by subsampling, like is in, uh, in general uh, difficult to obtain directly by a sensitivity analysis because sensitivity is kind of like worst case, <coughs> right? so it cannot really leverage the ran any, any kind of randomness or hardly so. So, people typically need to rely on the specific results. That use different uh, techniques, like results are like divergences uh, between these distributions and such. Uh, so I think in, in, in your proof, you seem to be able to kind of directly control sensitivity and have this amplification by something. So could you discuss a bit this part and what maybe makes this uh, possible in your case and not in, in others? Yeah, so that's the question I've been a bit investigating this last this last stage try to, to to understand better how it works compared to other work which i was not very familiar with but so the question is why is our result so different from uh, uh from um uh, privacy uh, from subsampling without replacement which is like the setting out who are who are actually having here because we just take a subset of uh, of the data sets um it's um i cannot exactly tell how what makes this difference but um i know that the difference i've seen by compared to other other paper like the one that was uh, maybe released at the same time or just after 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 this one is that um we really rely on this probabilistic vision using uh, just reasoning with expectation while there were more um the, there were more investigating the case where uh, they would use the privacy of each uh, on uh, compute the privacy on each batch uh, our statement was to uh, not really go in this direction but was maybe more around something with iteration and and, and and try to consider this from a probabilistic uh, standpoint um, so i don't have the exact reason and how it relates uh, uh, to this but this is the main difference i spotted uh, around these two works it was okay. we were trying basically to do the same thing. Okay, okay. Something we could discuss uh, potentially. I'm, I'm quite interested in that. Um, all right, and, and then maybe on the gains of your results. So, so I think you motivate mainly kind of uh, as a, like kind of extending this, this prior work, which uh, could only tackle the full gradient descent, mm -hmm. which is not very scalable. Now, another, of course, relevant comparison to your work is the, the traditional. GPSGD yeah. algorithm and, and analysis. Um, and this algorithm, somehow, we know we cannot improve mm -hmm. in terms of privacy utility trade off that much because we know that it is worst case optimal to log the log factors. 
So at the same, on the one hand, it's nice that you can have these privacy laws that kind of converges, right? But it doesn't look like it can bring or significantly improve the privacy to each other. But maybe it can improve other other things. So could you discuss a bit, like maybe yeah. how in which uh, in which uh, quantities maybe this this analysis improves compared to the DPNC? Uh, so the first. Um, uh, so the first part is really on the on the task where you have a large number of iteration and and that's the part where assumingly uh, we get um, we get an advantage well, obviously because it's converging but in practice the privacy budget we we get we get higher um, uh, from a new numerical set standpoint. Um, so it's not very useful for all the tasks. You have some tasks where you converge very fast, and in which case. It could be competitive with DP. DP SSD might be more competitive. And um, maybe what was also uh, interesting was to so for the experiment we compared DP SSD with uh, so with this setting where we need to have uh, strongly convex and smooth objectives, which is like a way to not take fully advantage of DP SSD. And and so um, because for DP SSD you can use uh, any kind of models and um, uh, what was maybe like interesting for us was to show that actually um, DPHD could not really take advantage from training all these layers that is theoretically possible um, uh, because it could not gain uh, any advantage. I think we have, I don't know if you have added this result in the paper or not, but as to say that if, if we if we train more than only the last layer, so the problem is not convex, but DPHD has no real advantage. So it was to, to just this to say that basically uh, this hypothesis of, which is, I mean, that's one of the main limitations of this work. For DPHD, uh, today it might not be, um, for different privacy, it might not be really a problem because uh, this is other a, a paper that says that, um, uh, I don't remember the name, but it says the same conclusion basically that uh, we're only able to do very, uh, uh, we are not able to do deep, deep uh, neural training uh, with the virus today. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, I guess maybe just a, maybe one little quick question on the more encryption part, which is not actually my uh, expertise. Uh, I was a bit uh, curious, I guess, about uh, extending this. So you assume semi-honest uh, security <coughs> before, right? So. Uh, maybe you can briefly discuss what uh, what would happen in malicious setting, whether there are ways to still ensure some kind of security, maybe under honest majority or something like this, and what would be the changes kind of and uh, maybe the costs. A bit, uh, I know this uh, is probably like uh, many, many, many ways to do this, uh, but to discuss so, the, the, the suspect that would be nice. Obviously, the, the experts are with the UR, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I can give the first. Um, the first element is function secret sharing. This, as I've as I've presented, actually so first only works with two parties, um, and and for a very good reason based on on the way uh, the SOA operation is overutilized in the protocol. So in this situation, we are only concerned about one party trying to uh, divert from uh, the original protocol. And uh, what you can do actually is say so. All part, both parties are contributing to a model evaluation, uh, but one will be maybe the model owner, and the other one will be the data owner. As data owner, what I can do is I send a picture. I get a I get a result. Let's say it's uh, it's the signal directly, not the argmax. I get the output signal. I will send the same picture another time, so the other party is not aware that I'm using the same picture, and. At the last layer, I will just change my, my share by adding a small bias. And I will observe how it influenced the last uh, the output signal. And this difference in the output signal actually allows you uh, to know the, the weight of the last layer of uh, the model. And this way, you can try to, um, to reconstruct part of, uh, of the model. So that's a way where you will uh, try to attack um, to, to uh, try to attack and uh, uncover your uh, the, uh, the other uh, parts model. 
Okay, and so I'm waiting to prevent this. So how to prevent this for function sequestering? Um, honestly, I, I don't know. You want if you have some suggestions, um, I have to fine. but I don't have some. All right. Um, thank you. Then uh, just quickly some, some a bit more general questions. So you mentioned, uh, I don't remember which slide it was, so, but also in the thesis, right, that these uh, differential privacy, encrypted computation, and so on, they are, right, to some extent, complementary because they, they aim to protect different things and then they can kind of help one another in, in actually many respects. Uh, but is that, do uh, you think that combination is uh, is so straightforward? So, so can we just straightforwardly combine the two or or is there some some aspects that require maybe care or even can be research uh, questions? So um, there is like an important challenge in terms of uh, implementation first. So it's not um, it's not really straightforward how to how to do this. Like if you're doing IGP secret sharing, uh, the way to um, add the noise in an additive secret sharing way is not uh, trivial at all. I think there's a line of work around this and showing that in some case, if you are not uh, doing this properly, using numerical methods, you can just remove the weight, uh, the, the noise, sorry. And, and so there are like many changes around implementation uh, first. And on, on the theoretical side, I'm, I, I don't know exactly. I, I, I would tend to say that I would be rather optimistic and say that they could be combined quite, uh, quite easily. Uh, but I guess the challenge is really on, on the on the technical side. Okay, so, uh, so maybe there are some difficulties also on the other one. Some challenge maybe having something end to end. So I guess yeah. you would need to add the noise required for DP somehow inside the yeah, exactly. right? Which if you need to draw from some specific distributions in a secure way, might maybe not be so easy to do. Yeah. Okay. Now that's that's the part where I think there's this paper, well, quite old one from Mironov, um, that says that just investigating how the noise was, you, you could observe the noise and I don't remember now exactly, but you, there's a way to like really remove the noise if it's not done carefully. And, and I think now the modern uh, GP libraries uh, use the, uh, the, the technique that uh, it proposed to, yes. to protect from this. Okay, and maybe one uh, last question to reflect on your conclusion, which uh, I thought was quite interesting uh, to get the perspective and uh, talk about these challenges maybe uh, around regulation or also. Mm -hmm. so, so do you think that, uh, I guess you do, <laughs> hopefully, that uh, privacy enhancing technologies like the one you introduced, they can help to abide to regulation like GDPR? And in so, if so, how? Because GDPR, of course, doesn't really Specify things in you know in terms of satisfying the pressure policy guarantees or or things like that, right? So, so I think you have some experience with also health uh, data. And so, so um, yeah, I'm curious to know that, uh, um, about this. So there is this extremely challenging uh, question of how much different privacy that we allow, that we should allow. Like, a, a, I don't know if a regulation should say okay. Epsilon equal to one, or epsilon equal to, I don't know, to any random number. They will never do that. Yeah, I, I don't think so. So um, that's that's one of the huge limitations of uh, having a regulatory context over different privacy. Um, I guess the way it's, it can be still used is um, if you see maybe like the, the CNIL in, in, in France, and and there are, what they say is that you should take all measures uh, to, that you can um, uh, feasibly implement to protect your data. So in, in this perspective, using privacy with some bounds that are commonly used in the community is, is a good uh, way to achieve this. Um, you will not get any certification or recognition for doing this. It's, more, it's mostly a reputational uh, thing to do today, but it's also a way to set standards. Um, in a sense, like if more and more people start doing this by default, as websites have as, as started to use HTTPS by default, then you set you set the standard high, and and all the other actors will uh, then start using these techniques, and then at some point we'll say, okay, now we have some uh, sufficient um, uh, insight on what happened in the past to say, okay, uh, we can 
at this with some revelation. But today, it's, I don't think anyone is, is willing to, to, to give one, one uh, direction to follow. All right. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, Chris, uh, Jonathan, if you would mm -hmm. go ahead. Thank you to you for the presentation. And well, it's great to see the journey you've been through uh, all of these years, like keeping working on these nice privacy challenges. Um, I've got two types of questions, some more technical and some more like on the LV of your work and, and like you know, perspective on, on that kind of thing. <clears throat> on, the, on the functional encryption side, maybe a naive question. Uh, what, is there anything that prevents you from um, from using it the other way around. Like, yeah, that's perfect. So what you do here is like you, you've got you've got the first part of the network that's fixed, you freeze it, and then that's the one you run the you, you run in the encrypted fashion. Right. And the second part, the part that does the prediction, is in plain text. Yeah. Could you do the other way around? Could you switch mm -hmm. it the other way? Because like my my assumption is that the early layers are gonna have more generic features, so they're less sensitive in a way, whereas like the final ones are where the sensitive information is, is so that's the ones you want to protect. Yeah, so that, that, that's a, a very good question and um, and I guess at that time we were like really focused on this functional encryption uh, question, so we did not have the broader vision on, on this part, but in practice and, and especially like for vision, for language recognition, those first layers, they are Basically, always the same, doing yeah. the same thing, doing very generic uh, uh, operation. And um, the part that might be tricky is so if you say that, uh, so usually if you do them in plain text, um, what you will do, you will try to have the different data owner running them and then sending so the features that are out, uh, that goes out. And so you might to, you might make sure that these data owners are able to run these layers. It might, I don't know if they are. That's computation intensive, but it might be a question. Um, but then that would be the, I, I think, the most efficient way to go. Um, and of course, encrypt the argmax. Yeah, always. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, then another one. Uh, how do you skip on the on the Aryan part? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you had it on the on the slides or if it was in the in the report, but you. You make some comparisons with Prickflow. Uh, uh, maybe I'm the report. Yeah, maybe the report. Script flow, yeah. So I was curious because, like, you, you, you play against crypto at some point, and they, I'm more familiar with like Prickflow too. So I don't know if like there's a huge gap between the two the two papers. It, it's all right. <laughs> we got <Yeah>. it. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the main conclusions they have in, in Prickflow too is that. If when you switch to, to the one setting, their protocol is more efficient in terms of communication. To the one setting? Uh, from LAN to one. So oh, to, yeah. yeah, to local from local to wide. Yeah. They they have two definitions of their protocol, one, one using oblivious transfer and another one using homomorphic encryption. Mm -hmm. And when they go from local to wide, the homomorphic encryption one is more efficient. Mm -hmm. so the, the, the the communication is much smaller. And I was you do mention kind of like the opposite, that when you switch to wide, you still have less communications than you would have in uh, homomorphic ciphertext, for example. So I was wondering, where do you think this gap comes in? Is it something peculiar to uh, to the way FSS works, to, to the material you have to share? I'm less familiar with FSS. Uh. Um, so uh, maybe like I'm, I don't have in mind exactly the benchmark they have, but I, I, I kind of remember that they're quite efficient. The crypto two is is really like very impressive. Um, First thing is uh, the result that they sh share, I think, is for batch data. So in that situation, all of the discussion about uh, about communication is a bit different. I, I, it's still very important because if you're doing training, obviously you're doing batching. Yeah, otherwise, it doesn't make sense. For evaluation, it's a good question. There are some settings where I think that batch is just not relevant. You will not wait to have 100 image uh, before sending the, uh, the prediction. Um, and, and, and that's important because for protocols, uh, maybe that's the one that they're using under the hood for crypto, where you need to convert between some schema, additive binary sharing, or using oblivious transfer. Um, then this uh, conversion 
takes a lot of some takes a lot of communication rounds. So uh, that's the part where you lose a bit. Um, then obviously, if you're if you're doing a, a comparison or, or a question like this with all of encryption, you have no no communication left. But the conversion part might be expensive. Um, so that might be like part of of uh, of, of my of my answer. Um, then on the other part, I don't remember exactly. Uh, Yeah, I think that would be one, one point to investigate if it's bash or not. And, uh, and if it's bash, I, I, I mean, I think we can do better than just fully additive sequence sharing. I wanted to do this because um, uh, it gives like a simple and uh, crazy framework to understand. But even like papers like uh, Falcon that rely on, on ABY3. Uh, um, that very, very so interesting between the implementation and the switch between the different protocols and it works well. Um, but then you have to uh, leverage many different protocols. The future is hybrid. Uh, uh, probably, again, for non batch competition, yeah. yes. Uh, for batch competition, maybe. Cool. And, uh, and then now switching to more um, perspective, uh, broader questions. Uh, I, I kind of like the questions already have asked about the, the legal impact of all these things. How do you get to how do you get to, to bridge the gap between between the tech and, and the legal? And I think for healthcare, you've got kind of like the same the same issue. We we start to see that these things are possible and that you can get you know realistic result, impactful results that we've seen in the in the Nature paper on on using using pets for for healthcare. So in your opinion, like. And maybe you've got you know other perspective with Arkin as well. What do you think are the right incentives to convince these people to adopt this? Is it is it just like you know lobbying over and over again? Is it the reputation thing, or is it more unlocking new features by you know enabling privacy text for healthcare, for example? So one of the issues is I'm not sure you unlock any features today with the actual regulatory context. By using these techniques, that's the main issue. Like the legal framework is basically done for, is not adapted. So if you try to do something fancy with uh, some fully encrypted computation, um, maybe encryption, encryption is maybe uh, a part, but different privacy or further learning, you don't, you, you don't, uh, you won't check a particular case on, on a legal framework. So it's just reputational. You show, or, or, or it's. A technical advantage, but if you see like people like like um, like Google that do on the phones, it's both because they are able to uh, maybe send us data, and it's about reputation to show okay, like we care about privacy and stuff like this. And so again, I think that's it's maybe a sufficient reason for now that everyone can use to these techniques and, and get aware about them, and at some point we'll get the right uh, legal framework for the crypto part. Maybe we can. It can be more interesting. I, I don't know because in practice we are we are so far from this in in fields like healthcare. Uh, just only the the cleaning part is really it's so challenging. Uh, so I, I don't know exactly how it is, but I guess that if you have something that is proved to be secure and in a, in a, in a strong way, not only semi honest security, uh, I guess it should be good actually to, to be used in, in practice. Okay, and um, for more, more on the like challenges from a from a tech perspective. So, a lot of the techniques you've been using, it seems to me, are you know drawing from the sometimes cutting edge crypto literature and applying that to to existing deep learning machine learning uh, problems. Do you think that's that's where the direction of the field is going? Like. How are we going to keep on doing that with larger and larger networks, for example? Or should we, should we completely change mindset and try to change machine learning to adapt it to crypto better instead of like shoehorning crypto into machine learning? Well, I'm a bit biased because I, I started from, from machine learning, so I wanted to have the tools I'm, uh, the tools I'm used to, but in an encrypted way. And, and basically, I wanted to make sure that I can just use my re my regular toolbox. box. Um, obviously, this is not uh, realistic. Like when we said we have a slowdown from 100 or 1,000 times, this will not be sustainable. Uh, 
even in terms of compute power, like if already with two GPUs you are struggling to train your your BERT or NLP model, um, you will never use 100 GPU to do this. It makes no sense. So um, for complex neural network, we, we need to find another way, another way to do so. For NLP, maybe we can just use the technique that we have mentioned to say that you have this public feature that are reputed to be good enough. So a huge part of the model might be uh, done only publicly and we'll, last, we'll keep the last layer uh, for encryption. This might be a way. For vision, uh, for small ne networks that actually are not quite efficient in practice. So we can say, OK, we'll be a bit sober in terms of, of um, machine learning tooling that we use, so smaller neural networks, or maybe just not deep learning and some more classic machine learning methods, maybe also uh, powerful in, in many situations. And, um, and so this might be the other way around. So okay, maybe we'll not get this very last percent of accuracy of state of the art model, but it will be still very good uh, instead of having nothing because privacy is not guaranteed and we are not able to do machine learning. Okay. That's it for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the great and clear presentation. I have uh, some questions. Some of my questions were already asked. These <laughs> <laughs> questions, probably some more generic. I will start from uh, the beginning. Uh, when we uh, try to uh, design uh, this kind of uh, privacy preserving algorithms, our first challenge is the date. That means uh, how, and I think that was also in your, your last uh, slide, how find data, not just because we should pre-process it, but, but also because we should uh, parameterize our algorithms or make our algorithms specific for type of data. What's for you the best approach? So, um, again, I, I'm a bit biased, but uh, uh, what I believe, like I will speak for health here because that's the field I, I, I know best. Um, we have some standards of data that exist here, tabular standards or other standards for APIs or stuff like this that exist that have been there for like 10 years and we know that they are quite um, stable. Um, if we are able on the one hand to make sure that data from a different part of the hospital can be expressed with such standards, and on the other end, that we have these connectors to machine learning models that are able to read from this data, just as we have in, in, um, in NLP. In NLP, we have this format that are very standard. Uh, if you're doing name to recognition or stuff like this, <coughs> you can have this at a broader level in healthcare. And um, I think we should aim at this. Uh, uh, there are obviously a lot of challenges under the hood how to do this properly, but. I think it's one of the only way we can get to do this without doing data cleaning each time you want to do a study. Because in some cases we need that we have a data that is with closed um, distribution from the one that we applied to precise our precision or to, to really fine tune our algorithm. Uh, it's the same that we can use the, or what kind of approach to generate data that's really close. Ah, it's just synthetic data. It's, uh, yes, it's, um, it's more about the domain of synthetic data. So that's a part that um, that we have investigated. Uh, the problem with synthetic data is um, either you know exactly what you want to generate, so in which case um, the number of insight that you can get is strictly slower than the, the knowledge that you put in or you don't know exactly what you re re release and might get in, in, in privacy trouble at some point. So that's not a field that I know very well. Uh, I've played a bit with this, but um, I would be a bit, uh, well, it depends. Maybe, maybe there is some very standard analysis. And for this case, you just generate synthetic data where you know exactly what you put in and, and uh, people will be able to retrieve it. But at some point, I would say just, just release the mean, the uh, standard deviation from different data samples instead of doing a generic uh, synthetic data set. Uh, otherwise, um, I would be afraid, but I'm not an expert of this. Okay, thank you very much. 
The second question is uh, about uh, your uh, contributions on the PICIT and uh, what uh, the main uh, challenge is in the implementation domain. That means uh, the crypto, the challenge on the crypto side we know, but what are the main mm. challenge to implement and to implement the project? So, um, I guess our main challenge uh, was um, stability, actually. Uh, this is so a library that is, um, that is uh, I think there are like more than 300 contributors, and um, it does not always follow the best coding practice standards. <laughs> and so at some point, it's very hard when you have layers of a layer to understand what is wrong when something doesn't work as expected. And um, I think uh, myself and Jason also as well, I spent a lot of time debugging the library and trying to understand what's, uh, uh, what was uh, wrong. And uh, yeah, there was like real software, uh, software engineering uh, classical problems, not enough testing, not enough stability, um, a code base that becomes too large, that is refactoring and uh, stuff like this. Okay. One question that it's about the federated learning uh, section and uh, what for you the difference or the different challenges that we have in the federated learning regarding the multi-party computation? Um, so one, one issue is here that uh, the multi-party computation protocol that are very efficient Usually, usually work for two, three, or four parties, but not for n parties. So in this case, um, we usually want to do for learning with n parties, not with three parties. Doesn't make well, so first step, but it's not sufficient to have a real impact. Um, so we need to find a way to to uh, to do so. In I think in the yeah in the IM paper, we tried to sketch a way to to do this by having a pairs of interaction, like the data owner will do. A uh, secret sharing schema between himself and one data owner, mm -hmm. and and then with another another schema with the other data owner, and so on. And at some point, uh, you try to reconcile this, but on very simple operation because usually in federated learning, you would do just aggregation, which is a simple operation that allows to a bit uh, step ahead from the security part computation protocols with the aggregation part. So that's the way we propose, but. Um, uh, that that would be a bit uh, the challenge here. And what happens if one of the player is not connected? Is it still work the protocol? So if one part is disconnected? Yes, if one so, is not available. So in this scenario, where we do just uh, pair interaction, actually if one is connected, it's not really important. So this part is lost, but the, the other one are not affected except if it happens during the aggregation part, which should be very short compared to the training uh, training time. In this situation, it would be more challenging and you would have to start again the aggregation part, but since it's a very efficient uh, computation, it should be okay. okay. But uh, yeah, if you have like very generic service protocols and one pair, you need to start everything. All one of the share it's lost in yeah. the, the network. <laughs> That's true, and then, uh, I don't know what you can do. <laughs> okay, uh, one question about uh, the GPU versus the CPU um, optimization um, uh, in uh, in the uh, um, in the IES part. It's uh, what's the factor? What's the speed up uh, between the two implementation? Um, so um, for uh, for this part for the CPU part was um, implemented not by myself but by uh, Pierre that was also part of this paper in Rust. Mm -hmm. So we have like top efficiency on, on, on this part, and um, uh, but still I don't know. I think the factors was like three or four times. So it's not that important, but mm -hmm. because most of the time is spent on uh, uh, on on the AES computation. That's where we get the speed up, even if the GPU implementation is a bit loose compared to the rest one. Okay, okay. And probably one last question uh, about uh, the MPC comparison uh, algorithm. I just uh, try to understand uh, why there are 
în față o, o, o ață de chi, dar de ales numărul communication, am luat de difference regarding classical uh, uh, protocol, in which we just present uh, the numbers as a bit, so to do the circuit using the Boolean backend uh, in MPC way. So, um, here the, the, the reason why you only have one round of communication is that we actually follow this very standard uh, framework. So the only uh, communication is here when you reveal the masked value. Uh, this function shares that are doing the, the, uh, the bit tree comparison are already computed ahead of time and distributed by the crypto pro provider. So once uh, you, have, you have revealed this masked input, the path is no longer need to interact. So that's why we have more and more of interaction. That means one and one per bit that we can do together for all bits, or uh, it's one per. Uh... The, here you have uh, you have all the bits comparison that are uh, bundled together, so uh, sequentially. So you have those first 32 comparisons that, that happen here, and you don't need any uh, you don't need any interaction anymore to compute all of this. Uh, actually, it's using correlated randomness, so each part is. Uh, do the uh, bit comparison sequentially, and uh, the correct randomness uh, makes sure that at the end, um, if uh, if the data is, is to be true, um, they will have it will sum up to one, and if it's uh, basically and if it's false, it will sum up to zero. Okay. Uh, also, the communication cost is less than the size of the Boolean circuit. So, uh, just about the. That's a very impressive thing. Regarding the benchmark, the final benchmark, when we compare what's the gain if we take the full benchmark, the computational plus the communication yeah. together. What what's the factor from the previous approaches? So it it really depends. Um, um, uh, that's a good question. Like I think I uh, know. This way, um, we get it. So, if we compare with different library, so we compared with maybe um, so all libraries like uh, Secure and that was released in, in 2018, uh, we were like much more efficient. I would say, I can't say the factor, but actually, uh, other libraries like, like CryptFlow, uh, I think, is faster than this one. Uh, Falcon is very competitive uh, with, with, with this. Uh, 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 run times, but um, if you take the example of, of Falcon, everything is written in, in C code, and um, and maybe the key difference is the model is hard written before the competition starts. While uh, here, like we are using the passive paradigm, where each time you want to do an operation, you uh, can uh, do it on the fly, and that's the main difference. So you just say, say okay, I want to do a convolution, so it's Send the instruction to the parties that complete the convolution. That has a, I want the ReLU activation function, and so you have this also this extra noise and, and extra uh, um, communication on, on practice that are due to the fact that it's more like online computation or it's called the proper time um, versus hard written uh, algorithm that you just execute very very fast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me first uh, congratulate you on the talk and the impressive breadth of the work you, you have carried. Uh, so I have a couple of, of questions. The first one is on the collateral learning and the mitigations you propose. Uh, so the second mitigation is uh, about adversarial training. And if I understood correctly, you need to know beforehand uh, the types of attack what, what is going yeah. to be inferred. So uh, what's your take on that? Is that a, a serious limitation or is that fine usually? Or can you go beyond that in case this is uh, required? So um, uh, yeah, this was like a, a really limitation at first. And um, so the idea was to say, OK, maybe we can simulate several adversaries. So we actually did the same thing, but we developed um, parallel resistance against a large family of models. But at some point, what we observed is just pro simulating one rather big uh, uh, adversary as, as part of the, uh, as the form of a neural network would actually provide good resistance 
against all types of algorithms. Like I think we we have some example like the uh, K, uh, K, uh, KNN um, algorithm or random forest or stuff like this, which. I guess you you uh, I won't have this. You have a question that the attacker is trying to. Uh, uh, so solve. yes, okay, that's uh, yeah, uh, that's a good point. Is that we um, we suspect that the adversary is only trying to infer the font, so we develop a resistance against the font. I think we have no resistance against any other kind of attack. Let's say that there, there was a third dimension that we would try to classify. I don't protect I, against. I, I don't. I don't think we, it will provide any substantial protection against against it. So um, that's uh, yeah. That, that's the limiting factor that we would have in practice. Okay. And so uh, in that mandate for something like differential privacy. Yeah. So the the first thing and uh, I would I would recommend is really like never disclose the output signal as such. But just quantized uh, information like the so with the argmax maybe the, the class some very simple confidence interval like very confidence and not confidence or something like really simple because this is where you where the attack really uh, leverages power is by using all the uh, information in terms of number of bits that is available to do something a bit um, a bit strange if already you reduce the output to a few bits then um, it becomes already much more difficult. It's still possible to use this uh, kind of attacks, <coughs> and um, and if you have, have sufficient uh, requests, um, and I'm not sure here that privacy would give you any guarantees because we are not protecting against the privacy of one individual. We are trying to do something really different that was that was what was intended. So okay. I'm not sure that this. Well, I haven't tried. Maybe it helps because just. With the noise, it it uh, provides enough confusion, but we haven't tried this. Okay. okay. <coughs> so my, my second question is about uh, uh, the use of uh, perhaps uh, multi-party computation for training and gradient descent. Like so, I guess it resonates with one question of Maria. Uh, do you have any formal uh, guarantees in terms of the DP provided using uh, secure multi-party computation bricks? For you know, interactions between uh, agents owning some data and uh, either the aggregator in the basic federated learning scenario or with other agents in the system. The guarantees in terms of what, sir? So, uh, I guess my, my question is can you leverage uh, security and party computation, sharing secrets between uh, two uh, other agents you communicate with? and uh, uh, Assuming they don't collide, then maybe uh, you provide uh, uh, some uh, inputs with a noise level that is uh, uh, jointly low but uh, individually high, and uh, so that's, I guess, like uh, splitting two shares with a high noise on each, but the sum is good, mm. uh, in order to uh, allow a training of a model. So uh, is that something you've tried or? So. I there's something that might be uh, really related in the future. So here I've just shown the case where each party just uh, adds some nodes on its contribution and send it back. Actually, if you combine this with secure aggregation, which means that you don't have the contribution of each parties in clear, but you just have the result, then you only have to add noise on the result theoretically. So it means that each party can add less nodes. So that's a, a, another. Uh, positive interaction that you can uh, you can get where you uh, at the end you end up with uh, that's like central difference privacy versus local privacy and you, you, you get a good, the same guarantees but with, with less noise. Okay, okay, so this is something that has been yeah yeah it has been investigated already. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, all right, so uh, I guess I, I have one very naive question on the uh, cryptography part. In the end, you mentioned you needed keys of uh, one gigabyte in size to uh, allow, I guess this was uh, using the model, so answering yep. queries. Exactly. Uh, uh, and this was with the functional uh, encryption approach. This was with the functional secret sharing approach. Yeah. Right, right. And there, can you leverage, uh, I guess, again, secure multi-party computation with uh, more than one uh, 
uh, uh, agent you communicate with in order to to alleviate the problem. Is that, is that something that's uh, so well more generally? I mean, what, what, what's as a crypto expert, what's the way forward to alleviate this problem? Um, the problem of of the size of the keys is. Uh, uh, is actually a complicated one because it's, it relies on correlated randomness, and I, I'm not sure how we could uh, reduce the size of the keys. What is sure that it, for this kind of protocol, we are really like constrained to having only two parties, like two uh, uh, two parties secret sharing, and having more would not, add, well, I don't know, it's would, would, would not help. Um, maybe finding another way to to. Uh, to do this, corrected randomness could help, um, but I must say uh, I'm not aware of such techniques. Splitting the model. Um, I don't know if we could split the model. Ah, yes, on different parties, and then they would send. Uh, yeah, that could be that could be um, a way to go forward. Like you kind of. Uh, uh, what they call like a split networks, where you you have some layers on one party and another one, and 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 the um, the communication will go from another one to another one. But then the issue is that you need to make sure that everyone stays uh, alive during the computation. Uh, if someone drops you, to, uh, you, you will lose everything. Okay. Thank you very much. So far. Thank you. So then you have a PhD supervisor. I don't know who wants to go first. You choose. Okay. So uh, Francis, go ahead. <laughs> because uh, I won't ask any questions. Maybe make a few remarks on the, the PhD. So as we, as you know, as you mentioned, this is, was a, an attempt at collaborating between like two quite different fields, like cryptography and, uh, and machine learning. And to me, this is only successful like such collaborations if you have like a student in the middle who's both like smart, fast learning, autonomous patients, and you were, and you're still hopefully <laughs> all of that. And so at the end, to me, this is like sure that it is possible to do collaborations, they have contribution both in, from the learning side and from the, from the crypto side. And I really enjoy our interactions. And you mentioned the acknowledgement that <laughs> sometimes it was like, uh, not a fight between communities, but <laughs> uh, a friendly fight <laughs> was the most rigorous. And uh, I think we lost on that one. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, I learned a lot from cryptography, uh, from both of you, and in particular you, Theo. And I hope I was able to contribute a bit from the learning side. And I'm quite proud of what you achieved, in particular for the deep learning things. Okay, I didn't ask you to go deep, <laughs> but you really wanted to go deep. So <laughs> I think it's important for the impact of your work and it's, I know it's very time consuming to have those like resonate 18 whatever in imaginary running and I think this is quite, quite impressive and congratulations on all the work that you have achieved and I wish you good luck for the next adventure whatever it is. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you very much. David? Okay, so I, 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 I assume that. Um, yeah so I completely <laughs> agree with uh, what uh, Francis just said, and uh, it was a pleasure to supervise this uh, thesis. I learned a lot on uh, machine learning, uh, but so I will ask a question. <laughs> yeah, I have a question about uh, differential privacy because uh, maybe a new were faced to, to this problem during uh, when you wanted to optimize something at some point. Uh, when you say it would be important to have uh, open source uh, differential privacy, etc., but um, um, I, I am uh, worried that uh, maybe it could be used, badly used, because I have the impression that differential privacy, if it is not used correctly, uh, can be devastating. And for example, when uh, some, some uh, records in the database are uh, correlated, for example. Mm. And uh, so what do you think about uh, differential privacy when there are correlations between uh, inputs? Because differential privacy only assume that uh, you will hide one, uh, one record uh, um, yeah, that, that, that's that's right, and it, uh, the guarantees degrade very very fast when you have like some corrected records. So, so that's um, that's an important issue. Maybe maybe at 
the end of the day, it relates to the question of data quality. Um, to say that you should be able to know that your patient is both in this hospital and in this other one, and make sure that you don't use this information twice to train your neural network. Otherwise, your guarantee doesn't make any sense. Um, so that would be a, a, a that could be a way to make sure you have some some very interesting protocols like private um, uh, private intersection uh, private security intersection um, that can help you to make sure that you don't share your information between several parties, but you know that you don't have common information, which can maybe prevent uh, this kind of situation that will be more prevalent in the fidelity learning. But that's the part where you don't know what the other have, and so. Privacy might be a bit uh, more tricky to get. Um, that's one part, and uh, yeah, that could be it could be a way. But uh, obviously, it's um, it's a challenge. Then, uh, however, uh, I think that having this algorithm uh, um, and also more importantly, open source is very important for for two reasons. The first part is uh, that people can proof check what has been written and uh, and so that um, you don't have someone say, ah, but this wonderful algorithm, but you cannot see it because it's a proprietary and, and you don't know actually if it's just secure or not. And the other part is that it's still helpful for other people to uh, to try it and to try these techniques, uh, get familiar with this, uh, instead of trying to do their stuff on their own and, and why it's more likely that they will fail at providing a secure implementation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, so I had a lot of questions, but then uh, <laughs> not much of them are remaining. Um, I still have a question on the um, aggregation rules that you have effectively used in your uh, federated learning. Because after all, in the honest, if everyone is honest but curious, you can get away with your federated averaging and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then in, in the manuscript, you seem to mention uh, other uh, rules tolerating data poisoning and so on, like perhaps mm. Scrum or this kind of, of rules. What, what is the impact of the aggregation rule on, on the, 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 perform, on the performance results and, and, and on the overall approach? That's, um, it's a point that is still unclear for me, like I've done some I not spent lots of time on quality learning itself because it was already a lot of research, mm -hmm. but I've experienced a bit like with PySift just to see maybe like the convergence time, for example, uh, between federated and non federated part. And, and um, the uh, small takeaways I had is um, there was some engineering to do to better understand why, like, federated learning was really not converging fast for me for my, in my experiment. And I'm not sure exactly uh, why. Uh, maybe uh, it was a question of learning rate, or I don't know. But um, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't really straightforward to just say, okay, uh, I followed my algorithm and to train uh, just like if all the data was centralized. So it's some, I, I know people are, are able to do nice things, uh, but I haven't spent enough time to really investigate how how it could work. You mentioned the. Um, all the uh, poisoning attacks. Um, that's the part that is uh, that is really tricky because you have some attacks that are very subtle, uh, some like this paper or how to backdoor for deep learning. But actually, it's not clear how you can uh, easily detect these uh, attacks, and and um, and so um, at the end, that's maybe. Um, why the people that are doing first learning in industry, they will use data owner that they control, like the mobile phones that are like, after using their own mobile phones to do first learning to make sure that people don't mess up with uh, uh, with the training procedure. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a really issue to try to detect this attack that maybe sometimes are really the side attacks that are hard to, hard to detect. Yeah. But that goes beyond the, the semi-honest uh, adversary. <coughs> yes, because it can be like it can be completely regular. Uh, um, you can completely abide by the protocol, but just the inputs you get uh, that you, you you put in are are just wrong, and and so you are perfectly secure, but you are just making your model learn nonsense. Um, so perhaps one a question a little bit more general, but um, in a sense, um, 
So um, um, uh, the, the, the crypto computing techniques, uh, they want uh, small data to be more and more efficient. So less and less precision and, 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 and the least precision, the, the better. On the other hand, uh, differential privacy lives in a world which is like continuous with Gaussian distributions and this kind of things. So this wants more precision. And my question is uh, how basically this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, lack or will of lack of precision from the crypto side interact with uh, the uh, differential privacy proofs that, that lives in this uh, continuous. Uh, so um, that's a very good question. And I suppose one, one of the, uh, the questions we had, we said, okay, if we quantize enough, in some sense, we add some noise. And we said, okay, maybe we get different, different privacy by default, which would have been really awesome. Um, we did not find anything around this, <laughs> but uh, it could have been, um, it could have been uh, uh, an idea. And, and the, other, the other question is, obviously, in the discrete world, how, how does different privacy still, uh, still hold? Uh, there is a very interesting uh, uh, work that is about discrete um, Gaussian noise. That, uh, so people of the of the different privacy community have started to explore how we can provide discrete noise that would be uh, so very useful this for this kind of implementation, and would still provide the same guarantees. Um, and and uh, I'm not very familiar with this, but I know it's quite challenging to do. But it has been a bit explored. And, and perhaps one last question, uh, a little bit naive on the uh, on the. Uh, so, so because you mentioned that sort of AES was uh, one of the computational bottleneck, and you implemented uh, your um, uh, uh, and you did some implementation on GPU, uh, but but there are also a lot of uh, hardware accelerator for AES, and there are also like uh, instruction in Intel processors for for accelerating this. So, uh, have you tried to leverage on these and compare the two and? Yes, so actually for the REST implementation, I think it was using this hardware impl implementation uh, there was like a crate or a package to, to, to do so. So that was what Pierre investigated and, and uh, while for the GPU part, um, it was just standard GPU stuff, uh, but we still had this factor uh, three or four acceleration, acceleration with, with the GPU. Uh, uh, but uh, we we, um, we did uh, investigate this uh, accelerated stuff on, on, on the CPU, but uh, okay, because there's many work and many also accelerators that then might uh, improve the, the, the yeah yeah we are, we, we have so. tried on, on, on only that one and uh, and uh, maybe there is other that could be also investigated. The CPU implementation uses just a single core or multiple. No, all the cores uh, are very ones. So it was like maybe eight or eight or sixteen. Yeah, uh, that was the advantage of the CPU part to to compete. Okay, so that's uh, that's all for the questions. Thanks a lot, Theo, for the answers. And